Und äh, ich sage für die, die dazugekommen sind, dass das eigentlich so heute nicht geplant war, weil wir hatten die große Hoffnung, dass wir an Boudoir aus äh, Paris live hier gehabt hätten. Äh, Corona hat uns relativ kurzfristig einen Strich durch die Rechnung gemacht und jetzt haben wir diese, dieses Arrangement äh, mit, mit der Dazuschaltung auf virtuelle auf virtueller Basis. So, for everybody, welcome in the State Library virtually, wherever you are. And so, um, we hope that you will enjoy the lecture. And I say, um, bienvenue, bienvenue à Anne Boudor et Estagarel, Estagarel à Strasbourg et Anne Boudor à Paris. Um, And I will pass now to Professor Richter, um, who is the, how do we say, uh, the main person in the workshop here in the State Library. And he will present an Butter. So, thank you. Ladies, gentlemen, a warm welcome also from my end. I am Sebastian Richter and I have the great pleasure to present our dear colleague Anne Boudor, the speaker of this evening. Anne Boudor started her academic career at Université Paris 4, where she received her maîtrise de lettres classique under supervision by Paul Barguet, and subsequently her uh, diplôme d'études approfondie and her doctorate under the direction of Jean Irigoin. After years as chargé du fond capt at the Oriental Manuscripts Department of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, she started in 1990 her position at the Institut de Recherche et d'Histoire des Textes under the roof of the CNRS, first as a chargé, later as directrice de recherche, to specialize in the study of Coptic manuscripts. In 2003, Anne Boudor did her habilitation at the Université Marc Bloch de Strasbourg. Uh, her thesis topic being Philology, Papyrology et Codicology Copt, Méthode et Enjeu. Anne Boudor is board member of the International Association of Coptic Studies, whose president she was from 2008 to 12 and she is treasurer of the Association Francophone de Coptologie, whose president she was until 1993. She is the editor of the Journal, Coptic, Journal of Coptic Studies and scientific board member of other academic series and journals. Anne Boudon has been teaching generations of Coptologists, beginners as well as advanced young scholars, both in regular university courses, as well as in summer school formats, such as the International Summer School in Coptic Papyrology, which is closely attached and largely owed to Anne Boudin's pedagogical passion. Anne Boudin's scientific stature is quite unique in the field of Coptology, and in, in that she has always been taking a virtually holistic approach to Coptic manuscript studies. She has been working in equal intensity on literary manuscripts as well as documentary texts, on the texts contained in the manuscripts as well as the manuscripts material features, the writing materials, codicological features and so on on the contents of texts as well as the linguistic norms employed in their composition. I mention here inter alia only her catalogues of Coptic fragments in the Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris and the Bibliothèque Nationale et Universitaire de Strasbourg, her studies on New Testament texts and documentary texts in the Fayumic dialect of Coptic, her clarification about the Coptic tradition of the Gospel of Mark, her masterly edition, editions of many hundreds of Coptic ostraca from Bawid and from Western Thebes, her two-volume critical edition of Shenouta's Canon 8, according to the comprehensive manuscript Ifao Copt II, and last but not least, 
her numerous overviews and detailed studies on topics in Coptic paleography and cardiology, the topics of our present workshop. Dear ladies, dear gentlemen, in and outside the Bonhoeffer Lecture Hall of the State Library of Berlin, we are very happy that Anne Boudin agreed to deliver an evening lecture on one of the most precious items among the many treasures kept in the Berlin State Library, an ancient Coptic book and its making, the Proverbian Codex of the Berlin State Library, manuscript OR 987. Dear Anne, we look forward to your talk and the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you very much, dear Sebastian. Uh, good evening to everybody. I am very impressed because I see on my screen that there are already 59 participants, so I, it's a big audience. So I am happy that I don't see everybody because I would be unable to speak. Uh, I would like to start uh, uh, in thanking very much uh, Sebastian Richter, who is a dear colleague and friend for inviting me in Berlin. Unfortunately, I could not go, but I was very happy to participate in this workshop uh, during these two days and, and still tomorrow. Um, it was very tiring, but very enriching at the, at the same time. And, uh, and uh, I think, uh, it's a good thing to repeat this kind of workshop. It's uh, it's very useful. I would also like to to thank my uh, uh, colleague, ex student, and friend uh, Petra Fijak, uh, conservator um, curator in the Staatsbibliothek, for organizing all these things, for switching to virtual to digital, and for taking care of all the material uh, details of of this. Um, I would also like to thank Anne Grishek, uh, who took care especially uh, for the material uh, organization, all the, the complication with the computer presentation, and, um, and Lajos Berkes for organizing the, the um, talk of this evening. So let's start uh, with uh, this very uh, beautiful and interesting ancient book, the Proverbian Codex of the Berlin State Library. I didn't see it in fact, but uh, I will try to talk about it uh, and I will do my best to, uh, to give you a good idea of what it is. If you had the idea of asking the authorities of the Staatsbibliothek for a look at this manuscript, you would receive this object. Oh. Doesn't work. Mm -mm. I can't move my <laughs> my PowerPoint now. Does the presentation not work for you, Anne? I can't. I can't. Uh, I, I I can go further in the PowerPoint. I don't know what happened. It, it was working uh, before. Maybe you can try to close and open it again. Okay. <laughs> Ça marche pas du tout. Oui. 
of us, and you would immediately recognize that it's not very old. Indeed, this cover or this binding is new. On the other hand, if you were to ask for the binding, you would receive this object, which is the old cover with the new and blank book block inside. Opening the new cover, you would have access to the pages of the old book, and you would immediately realize that they have been restored. You can see the small blank white filaments escaping around the, around the edges. Only this old picture of the manuscript gives an idea of the state of the manuscript around the time of its acquisition. The current state of the book is the result of a complex and fascinating process we are going to discover together. The manuscript is quite well known among the specialists of early books, and in this regard, it has received numbers or acronyms in different databases, all the designation constituting, so to speak, its identity card. For the library in Berlin, it is known as Berlin, Berlin, Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin, Preußischer Kulturbesitz, MS or OCK 987. In the Leuven database of ancient book, it is TM or LDAB 107968. In the PATH database, PATH database is the archeo new archaeological atlas of Coptic literature. It received the acronym CLM for Coptic Literary Manuscript 24 which is uh, in the old designation of Corpus Dei Manuscripti Copti Literari, the acronym is BA. According to its, its contents, it is a manuscript of the Proverbs in the Armimic dialect of Coptic. So it's often designated as the Berliner Coptic Papyrus Codex of the Proverbs. The word codex, as you may know, designates a manuscript made up of sheets folded and bound by contrast with a roll. In the rest of the lecture, I will often talk of our codex or the Berlin codex. The dimensions of this codex are, you can see on the screen, 125 millimeter A and 140 millimeter wide. It's in fact a not very common format, wider than I, and it's, uh, if you look at Turner uh, typology of early codex, it is type nine, aberrant form number two. There is only one other codex among the Coptic codexes, which has the same uh, particularity, and it is a Crosby Thruyen manuscript. This is not what we can call a miniature manuscript, but rather a pocket manuscript. About the provenance, the manuscript wa was bought in Cairo in 1905 by Carl Schmidt, professor of theology in Berlin, from the antiquity dealer Giovanni Datari. According to what Carl Schmidt was told during his stay in Egypt, the manuscript was found by Felaz in the necropolis of Armim, close to a monastery, so close to the city of Armim in Upper Egypt. It was it also told to him that the manuscript had been found with another manuscript kept, kept in Berlin, namely Stets Bibliothek Manuscript Oriental. Um, 3065, which is an armimic version of the first epistle of Clemens of Rome to the Corinthians. The mention of a monastery induced some scholars, first of, of all uh, Schmidt, to suppose that this manuscript could come from the White Monastery. This is White Monastery, a very famous monastery and the uh, very famous conservatory of the Coptic literature. 
it has been shown uh, since that it is probably fart. So the manus we don't know the exact provenance of the manuscript. Information given by manuscript seller is generally unreliable, as you know, because it tends to romanticize the story of the discovery in order to raise the price or to hidden the real place of discovery in order to keep the possibility of future more or less legal fines. Nevertheless, a provenance from this region is likely since it can be connected with the book production in this region. And we will come back at this point on the end of the lecture. After entering the collection in Berlin, the manuscript has been the subject of successive restorations, which I try to summarize, uh, summarize in this, this slide. First step, originally, the codex was made of papyrus sheets stacked and folded, a process we will examine in details in a few minutes. Step two, Sometime after the codex entered the Berlin collection, probably in the years 1920s, under the supervision of Hugo Ipscher, the binding and the codex were dismembered. The binding on the one hand was put under glass and preserved in a box, while the sheets on the other hand were put under glass as well and preserved in four different boxes. There were 43 glasses on the whole. Ipscher's description of the codex was published only after his death as an introduction to the edition of the text by Alexander Belich. It represents a considerable advance in the knowledge of the oldest papyrus codexes. It is important to note here that Ipscher did not separate the by folios or sheets. By contrast with what, with what was common practice at this time, and this proved invaluable thereafter. What was to come thereafter? First, World War II. Unlike many other manuscripts of the Staatsbibliothek that were moved and stored at Marburg, the glasses containing the sheets of the papyrus codex were considered too heavy and fragile to be transported. Therefore, they, st they stayed in the cellars of the library, at this time in the eastern part of Berlin. Third step, a little more than a decade after the end of the war, as Alexander Belich was working on the edition of the text, the son of Hugo Ipscher, Rolf Ipscher, had followed in his father's footsteps, especially for the restoration of Johann Sebastian Bach's old scores. Both men, Belich and Rolf Ipscher, agreed to try a re-restoration, what is called in German Umkonservierung, and to give the codex its original form again. The work was done by Rolf Ipscher in the winter 1957-1958. Each sheet was wrapped in silk chiffon before they were stacked and folded again, and a new binding was fabricated by Werner Kissy. The whole process is described sometimes in a lyrical tone in, in an article entitled Sur um conservirum des papyrus codex and so on. So here a picture of Rolf Hipscher at work. And on the following picture, you will see uh, Alexander Belich on the left and Rolf Ipscher on the, on the right. And you can, of course, compare. Uh, this is not the same time. This is not the same, they are not the same tools and it's not the same uh, way of, uh, of working. 
Besides uh, the advantage of returning the codex to its original form, the new preservation made it a handy object with a weight of one pound, whereas the 43 glass plates were very heavy. Rarely has a Coptic manuscript been treated so carefully, and this makes it all the more valuable. However, when you look and compare these two pictures, on the left before restoration, on the right after restoration, it is likely and it is uh, possible that the restoration has made the text less legible. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the re-restoration has probably protected uh, the papyrus. So it's not for me to judge of the validity of the restoration, not just to draw your attention uh, to the questions and advantages and disadvantages of uh, the restoration. Let's go now to the making of the codex. Who was Hugo Ipscher, who is in some way the hero of this story? Perhaps the best recognition of Hugo Ipscher's talents and achievements was provided by, by another great name of the papyrus codicology, namely James Robinson, especially well known for his role in the investigation of very important collections at the Nag Hammadi Codices or the Bodmer Papyri. In a study published in 1978, Robinson wrote, I quote, if the study of the papyrus codex had not yet become an established science of papyrus codicology, this impediment was alleviated to a remarkable degree up until World War II by a personal factor, the recognized genius of Hugo Ipscher in the field of papyrus conservation. Ipscher needed to generate generalization as working hypothesis if he were to succeed in moving beyond the relative unintelligibility of empirical data toward hypothetical codicological solutions, which in turn could be verified both by the way they facilitated the conservation and by the subsequent philological assessments of the text. That is to say, Hipscher combined induction with deduction, observation with construction, diligence with imagination, and thus rose beyond the level of master craftsman to that of a scientist." End quote. Robinson's article then examines in detail Ipure's study of the Berlin Codex, which was a crucial element in the elaboration of his methods and for the knowledge of ancient papyrus book. Let us recall at the beginning that a papyrus codex itself is fabricated from a roll because the roll was the form in which the papyrus was manufactured. A roll was created by pasting together a series of papyrus sheets, collemata. The sheet itself was made by superimposing at right angles two layers of several papyrus strips, so that one side of the sheet had horizontal fibers at the surface and the other one vertical fibers. The height and the length of the rolls could vary, vary the average age being 30 centimeters at the time of our codex. The cohesion of the sheet was ensured by overlapping a few centimeters of the end of one collema to the beginning of the next one. This overlapping is called collesis by papyrologists. I suppose that there are a lot of papyrologists among the audience, but perhaps not only papyrologists, and that's why I enter into these details. Then, 
Sheets for the future codex were cut vertically in the roll, and most of the time, a coalesces could still be observed inside a sheet. This is what we see on this slide. And uh, you can see that uh, at the beginning, the, the beginning of the red arrow mark the beginning of the coalesces, so the overlapping of one uh, colema to uh, the previous one. Then the sheet were stacked and folded. In the case of a small codex as ours, the question is, how could the stationer deal with rolls of an average height of 30 centimeters? Here I quote again Robinson's description of Ipscher's observations. And you must remember that Ipscher had taken all the sheets apart and laid them flat, which made such observations easier. I quote, By tracing horizontal fibers from coalesces to coalesces, Ipscher identifies the roles from which the choir was, was constructed. He even discovered the fact that two roles had been cut horizontally in two, had been cut horizontally in two, though that four dwarf roles, four small roles, were made from two tall roles thus providing four of the rolls that together with the fifth narrower roll were then cut into sheets that were stacked to form the choir." End quote. So the first two rolls must have been around 26 centimeter height and three meters respectively, almost three meters long each of them. The last roll was only 82 centimeters long. The sheets were around 29 centimeter wide and once folded, uh, we are reaching uh, the, wide, the wide of uh, a, a leaf, which is uh, about 14 centimeter. Let's now have a look at the construction of the book, which I borrowed from uh, the Atlas of Archaeological Atlas of Coptic Literature. So this is a single choir codex, which means that all the sheets were folded and, uh, and uh, were stacked and unfolded together. The first half of the codex contains leaves 1 to 42. The first page was left without text and without page number, probably for better protection of the text. And it is designated here by the letter A. And these uh, leaves 1 to 42 are the page 1 to 83. The second half of the codex contain the leaves 43 to 83, so the pages 84 to 162, and then page B, which is the verso of page 162, and page C, D, which again formed a flyleaf, a back flyleaf. You may also notice that there are three single leaves which are not counter counterpart on the other side. They correspond to pages 10, 11, and um, 70, 71. The third to uh, 116, 117. I uh, quote again Robinson's description. Ipscher identified three half sheets plus stubs, so what, um, other papyrologists call stub singletons, and he corrected the then dominant assumption about this phenomenon. 
it had been assumed without further ado that stubs are due to a scribal error or defective papyrus making it, making it necessary for a leaf to be cut out or secondarily inserted. Ipsha provided the interpretation, valid also at least for the Nagamadi codices, that half sheets plus stub are due to the remainder of a roll being too narrow to be used for a complete sheet, but too broad to be lightly discarded. A half sheet need, to be need, need not to be discarded if it has a conjugate stub passing sufficiently beyond the fold at, at the spine. Here on this uh, diagram, you cannot see the, the stub, which, which should be um, some small uh, here, a small stub should be here. So a half sheet need, need not to be discarded if it has a conjugate stub passing sufficiently beyond the fold at the spine for the, bin, for the binding songs to pass through it without tearing loose. Hipscher noted that one half sheet plus stub was positioned so that the stub would be in the first half of the, of the choir, the next in the second, and so on, to keep the two halves of the choir roughly in balance." End quote. Now, we saw that the recto of the first leaf serves as a front fly leaf, and the, that the last leaf, as well as the verso of the next to last leaf, serves as a back fly leaf. Moreover, there were four extra sheets in the stack, uh, which were, in fact, below and not visible on the, on, on the diagram. And these four extra sheets in the stack were passed down and used at the top part of a passboard cover. The technique of making the binding cannot be longer reconstructed in detail because it was not sufficiently documented when the manuscript was dismantled. especially the sewing cannot be reconstructed. But we can get an idea. Uh, this is the, the, the old binding and we can get an idea how, how it was. So we can look at this, at this, at this picture with a new uh, block inside. And you can, we can also look at an example, a later example from the Tiban region, uh, uh, the remains of uh, binding uh, probably from the 7th or 8th century. And of course, we can also compare with uh, the binding of uh, the Codex of Nahamed. And we can also read um, what uh, John Sharp says about uh, the making of old binding in his article, the earliest bindings with wooden board covers, the Coptic contribution to binding construction. It has some interesting details about the way of making uh, a cover. Uh, with the, I quote, with the earliest surviving examples of the papyrus single choir codex, Covers and text block were made of the same material. Several of the extra blank leaves, which form the outside of the book, sometimes as many as five leaves, were pasted together to form a cover of past board. The leaves which form the covers would have been part of the construction of the entire complement of leaves which formed the text block. Over these past boards, which served as upper and lower covers, covers, a leather covering was drawn, slightly larger than the text block. The excess, excess width then folded around the edges of fabricated papyrus boards and affixed to the inside margins of the boards. So here, yeah, the leather come here. Sometimes, a free blank leaf was pasted down to the inside of the board, covering the turn-ins of the covers. 
So this is uh, how the inside of the new uh, front cover looks like, trying to reproduce uh, how it was uh, in the ancient codex. Uh, this is the result of the restoration of the old cover by Werner Kisik. And then this uh, binding, this new binding, is now preserved in a, so, sorry, the old binding is now preserved in a small cardboard box, uh, embracing a, a choir of modern thin cardboard sheets. On, the picture, on this picture of the old big uh, binding, uh, you can see uh, some uh, decoration, um, blind tooled linear decoration, and uh, traces of holes uh, through which uh, the leather fastenings uh, were passing. So, um, Kisik, Werner Kisik, tried to reproduce exactly the the same uh, linear decoration and uh, the uh, fattening system uh, of, uh, of uh, clothing for the codex. It has been emphasized by several scholars and recently by Miriam Kruch conservator at the Papyrus Collection in Berlin, who examined the codex carefully, that this was, this was not a luxurious book. The quality of the papyrus, as well the, as the manufacturing process of the codex, point to a context where economic imperatives were at stake. In this respect, there is still a detail to consider before we come to the copy itself of the text. If all the sheets in the stack were cut to a standard breadth of 29 uh, centimeters, as I said, and as Ipscher thought at the beginning, but he would correct this assumption later. When the stack was folded into the form of a choir, the sheets nearer the top of the stack would, if cut in equal breadth, to those nearer to the bottom, protrude further at the leading edge of the choir. If the leading edge was, after binding, binding to be trimmed flush with the leading edge of the cover, there would be an increasingly wide strip of trimmed off wasted papyrus as one moved to the center of the choir. As noted by Robinson, in the case of the Armimic proverbs, this assumption is demonstrably false due to the dimensions of the original walls reconstituted by Ipscher. The most natural explanation for this situation is to assume that the stationer cut the sheets progressively narrower as he moved higher in the stack rather than to a standard breadth. By cutting the sheets progressively narrower, so that the stack of sheets would assume the appearance of a blunt pyramid, the stationer could reduce the amount to be trimmed off when the choir was folded and bound to the same minimal amount for each sheet, thus reducing the, the waste, again, an economic reason. This in turn raises the question of the order of the respective operations of copying, copying and binding. As noted by Ipscher, the outer margins of uh, the codex seem to be consistently of the same breadth. It is not the case as it seems for the inner margins which are narrower near the center of the choir. If the copyist wanted to keep more or less the same written surface, which is square and about um, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. So if he wanted to keep the same written surface, the inner margin 
was the only place where he could compensate for the progressive narrowing of the sheets. In my view, this is in favor of copying before binding, although I cannot be completely sure without examining carefully the, all the pages of the codex uh, directly in the collection. And uh, if it is right, it is also in favor of stationer and copyist being close to each other, if not the same person. So we are now ready to look at the proper work of the scribe, of the copyist. The Berlin Codex contains 162 written pages. The text is written in full page, which is expected both for ancient books and for this kind of text. Uh, in Coptic, so-called sapiential text as Psalm, Proverbs, and the Book of Job are generally arranged in full page by contrast with other texts written in two columns. There are 15 to 18 lines in one page. By comparison, another pocket parchment manuscript of the Proverbs in Sahidi Coptic, kept in Chicago, probably assignable to a slightly later time as 202 pages um, and um, 22 lines per, per page. The dimension are also slightly different. This is just to have a, a comparison basis. So page A is blank as we, say, as we saw and not uh, numbered. Uh, a cross is written in the center and, uh, and uh, indicates the beginning of the book. The text then starts on the verso. So page one is on the verso. And the text starts without title. Actually the title is the first verse of chapter one Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, who was king of Israel. So according to a tradition uh, in late antiquity, uh, the, the, the texts have no title, but they have sometimes subscription, and it is the case here. So we have um, a kind of finite title or subscription, uh, which uh, uh, Emparoimia and Solomon, Proverbs of Solomon, written in a frame. And of course, uh, you, you observe the two uh, very interesting uh, crosses, uh, en, en crosses, or um, we, we reminding very much uh, the old uh, Egyptian uh, hieroglyph. Uh, such crosses are quite common in old uh, Coptic manuscripts. Uh, there is another one in the Codex Glacier, and there is also uh, one or two other ones in other Armimic uh, manuscripts uh, belonging probably to the same uh, uh, milieu. So page numbers, when visible, are written in the center of the upper margin. Um, not here, obviously, and Perhaps here, yeah, page numbers are not always visible. The biblical text of the Proverbs is divided into chapters and verses, and verses in turn are composed of two or three lines called stikoi. This division is carefully respected in the Codex. This is again a difference with the Chicago manuscript where the text is written continuously, which is rare, by the way. Moreover, the scribe, the copyist, put a small horizontal line, so a kind of paragraphos or, or obelos, in front of the beginning of each verse. When a line is too long, the copyist can choose to write its end at the next line, as you see here. Uh, I lost 
here, here, here. And the indentation uh, he, he gives to, to the next line is uh, uh, various. However, he did not always uh, choose this solution. On page 61, we have an interesting view of the three options the copyist had at his disposal in order to deal with the end of the lines. The first option was to tighten the writing. And you can see this phenomenon on line two. It, it, it tightening the, the writing. The second option was to write the last letters above the line. And you can see this uh, at the fourth line from the bottom. So this is again a very common practice in manuscript. And the third one, when it was really too long, is to use a new line. The writing is arranged according to the ancient principle of scriptio continua. Of course, I suppose everybody knows that scriptio continua is the principle according to which there is no separation between the words or grammatical units. So a transcription of the, of the passage of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 23b to 25a allows you to see how the text would like once edited nowadays. So this is Armimic Coptic. So this is Coptic, uh, whose graphic system uses the 24 letters of the Greek alphabet, plus six or seven special letters borrowed from the Egyptian system and adapted to uh, enter the design of the new script. This codex is written in a particular dialect of Coptic called Armimic. I will come to the question of the dialect in a, in a few minutes, but it can be immediately pointed out that graphically speaking, Armimic is the only one to have the letter, this letter, that is to say, uh, the same letter as this one, a hori, uh, but crossed out. So as Copticists know, when not crossed out, the letter is called hori, according to the medieval tradition. So crossing out the letter was probably meaning, attention, this is not a hori. The phonological system of this dialect was then different from the other ones. Um, as for the script, so to describe a script can be fastidious and subjective. Nevertheless, here some insights are possible thanks to a combination of three approaches. First, assessing the general aspect according to some criteria. Second, picking up some particular letters and third, finding comparisons in other manuscripts. Here, the writing is upright and it tends to be unimodular, which means that each letter fills a theoretical square. I say tends to be unimodular because on the one hand, some letters are necessarily wider and some others narrower, but above all, because we have already noticed that the scribe is tightening the script when it comes to the end of the line. Now, tightening implies giving up a perfect unimodularity. And this we can observe notably in the case of the letter epsilon, sometimes round, sometimes narrow. As for individual letters, the mu, and the epsilon have discriminant forms that uh, they are, uh, uh, there is uh, what we call in Coptic paleography uh, three strokes mu and uh, two strokes uh, epsilon. And alpha is quite remarkable. It has a triangular form 
And the extended left part at the beginning of the line is very frequent in the manuscript because the connecting word end, uh, which often begins the verses in the proverbs, is au in Coptic, in Armenic Coptic. So it happens very often that uh, the left part of the alpha in au is extended on the left. So comparison, as I said, are uh, um, possible, but are again a delicate matter. I could have uh, chosen many, uh, many different manuscripts. So I selected two examples of manuscripts assignable to the same period. So one of them is written uh, in the same dialect and has the same square format. Uh, its script, it's not the same, but some letters are similar uh, in style. Uh, the other one on the right, it's uh, from the famous collection uh, uh, called the Bodmer Papyri, it's a P. Bodmer 23. Format and dialect are different, but I selected this because the alpha has a rather similar shape. As for the ink, it has been analyzed by Thea Gigo in uh, the frame of a large investigation of inks used in Coptic manuscripts. If I understand if I understand her correctly, uh, his devastating result in, is that this codex could be one of the earliest use iron, of iron gall ink. Uh, if Thea Gigo is um, uh, among the audience, I suppose she could answer some question about the ink at the end of this talk. Um, Alexander Belich, the editor of the manuscript thought that it could be the copy of a student. Some arguments can be made in favor of this hypothesis, such as the economic imperative in the manufacturing of the codex, the irregularity of the script in some pages, as well as the, as the use of the paragraphos at the beginning of a new verse. However, this raises the question of what was a student as, at this time? It's a large question and I don't uh, plan to discuss it now. It would perhaps be appropriate to speak of a private copy, but again, this concept doesn't sound very satisfactory either. As we know almost nothing about the conditions and milieus of book production at this time. So let's come to the issue of the date. Since the beginning of this talk, I have been speaking of this time, ancient period, and so on, without mentioning a date. In a recent book entitled God's Library, the Archaeology of the Earliest Christian Manuscripts, Brent Nongbri is dealing extensively with what he nicely calls the dating game showing with several examples how hazardous the game is. The Berlin Codex has been dated from the end of the third century until the end to the, of the fifth century, according to different scholars. Had the book provided dated documents reused in its cover, as it happened sometime, we could have a relatively sure terminus postquem that is to say, the codex could have been made openly after the date of the documents. But the few papyri with Greek script mentioned by Hugo Ipscher as part of the past board cover have not been studied as far as I know. Basing on paleography does not allow us to reduce the uncertainty very much, but comparisons point rather to not going further than the beginning of the fifth century. This is in accordance with other manuscripts written in the same dialect and coming from the same region, as we will see at the end.
I will uh, finish uh, this uh, lecture with a few words about uh, the, the text of, uh, of the manuscript. After an uh, unfinished, uh, unpublished attempt by Karl Schmidt and Georg Steindorf, the edition of the text was completed by Alexander Bölich in 1958. Bölich already had written his PhD dissertation of this, on this text, which he defended in 1936, but he had lost a lot of his preparatory works during the war. The publication was much expected as the manuscript was important, both as a witness for the Armimic dialect and the complete witness of the proverbs in Coptic. As for its dialectal value, copies of the manuscript had been made as soon as the year 1920s, which allowed two famous scholars to make use of the manuscript in their works, namely Walter Thiel in his Armimich Coptische Grammatik, published already in 1928, and Walter Krum in his Coptic Dictionary, published in 1939. From the textual point of view, Bullish could demonstrate, and it was confirmed and precise by Polotsky in his review in 1960, that the Armenic version in the, is a daughter version of the Saidic one. That is to say that it, is, it has been translated from Saidic, but it has the advantage to be a complete witness of uh, the Saidic version written in another dialect. Um, here, perhaps a few words about Coptic dialects are in order. Um, in the first two uh, centuries of, it, of its existence, let's say fourth, fifth centuries, there were several varieties of Coptic. These varieties are designed by letters. And from the sixth century onwards, Sahidic dialect S became predominant and the minor dialects of Upper Egypt disappeared. So in the map on the screen, you can see that dialect A, linguistically speaking, is the more southern of all dialects. Whereas Armim, which is uh, the name of a uh, the equivalent of Greek Panopolis or Coptic Schmin. So Armim is further northwards. Actually, the name of the dialect was chosen at the end of the 19th century in accordance with the place where several manuscripts displaying the same linguistic features were found about. It must be emphasized that the natural area of a dialect has not necessarily something to do with the place where a literary norm is at work. Books written in Armimic, and then here you have a selection of books written in Armimic, can be of different forms, material, scripts. Um, they may come uh, all uh, from a certain production milieu, active in the fourth century, uh, was culture, activities, and goals are still to be clarified. So here uh, in this selection, um, uh, you have uh, some uh, manuscripts kept in uh, Paris, Vienna, Berlin, uh, Strasbourg. Um, so here, um, a leaf of, the, of Exodus in, uh, in Armimic. Uh, here, a leaf uh, on... Um, a codex of the minor prophets uh, on parchment, the only example on parchment, uh, kept between Paris and Vienna. Uh, here, uh, the uh, leaf from a papyrus codex uh, in Strasbourg, uh, which contains a version of the first epistle of Clemens of Rome to the Corinthians, here, uh, the same work in another translation kept in Berlin, again uh, in the Armimic dialect. On the top, uh, center top, uh, a leaf of a codex um, 
uh, discarded between Paris and Berlin, written in Armimic, and this is the Apocalypse uh, of Elias or Sophonias, I don't remember exactly, but uh, an apocryphal apocalypse. And here, uh, this is uh, again um, a leaf of an Armimic uh, codex uh, kept in Paris. And I don't remember which text it is, but as you can see, uh, different kind of, of text mixing um, old apocrypha, uh, biblical text. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, um, um, cultural, um, uh, quite um, homogeneous uh, milieu, but again, um, and, and to this milieu, our codex, uh, Berlin Codex of the Proverbs, probably uh, belongs. Uh, there is a lot to do on, uh, on, on these Armimic manuscripts. Uh, we were quite neglected uh, for, for, for a long time, probably because uh, they were um, already uh, bought uh, when the big discoveries of Nagamadi and the Bodmer Papyri came, and, uh, and they have been left behind. In any case, I don't think that uh, this book production again fits uh, with the white monastery. Of course, uh, the white monastery is very close uh, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, geographically speaking, uh, but Armim was a big town and uh, there were certainly uh, many monasteries and probably also many uh, different uh, a cultural and social cultural milieu. All this, I hope, um, will be um, uh, studied. It had already uh, begun by Nathan Karlik, um, who uh, is, uh, we had already written a kind of uh, synthesis article of this uh, Armin Papyri, studying uh, especially the, the script, the formats, uh, the codicological study and uh, Nathan is, uh, is uh, planning to, to, to spend uh, one or two more years on, uh, on these uh, manuscripts. Um, so I think that uh, it was my last, last word. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, so I uh, hope you could find your way in my explanation, especially about the making, because I think it I know that it is a complex thing. Thank you. Layosh, I, can, I, I can't hear you. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I just repeat myself. Thank you for this very interesting uh, lecture. And I'm sure there are questions and comments and I will explain now how we will do this. So there is a real audience here or both audiences are real, but there is an audience here in uh, Berlin and there is an online audience. And we will take questions in turn. So one from here, here, you have to come here to the microphone in order that it hears you. And then we will do one through Zoom. Through Zoom, uh, in our colloquium, the usual method has been that, I mean, in the last uh, instances that people can just speak up, feel free to switch on your webca webcam as well to ask questions. But we will start with a question or comment from here, from this room. So please, is, are there any questions or comments? Thea, please. Yes, Han, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Yes. Hi. Yes. So I wanted to comment on what you said. Yeah, it is true. Um, it is among the first evidence of uh, the earliest evidence of Iron Link we, we have so far, despite the dating is problematic. I just wanted to point out that actually it was the analysis was published as part of uh, the article uh, that, that I wrote, one of my first pieces that I wrote in, in cooperation, of course, with my supervisor. But the analysis was made from her 
her from Ira Rabin. So it was yeah, made from her here in the Stabi together with Miriam Krunch, who's also sitting here in the public. So I just wanted to point out that. Thank you. Thank you. So now we can switch to a question from the internet. So please wait a, just one or two seconds before you uh, speak up to, not to, uh, in order not to interrupt each other and then just uh, start uh, asking. And if you feel like, switch on your webcam. Can I begin? Uh, I am uh, Alberto Complani from Rome. Uh, thank you, Anna. <laughs> Um, I, I uh, am uh, very interested in uh, the intellectual dimension of what you just said, that is uh, the question of uh, academic and the connection of this discourse with, uh, with the codicolo um, codicological uh, unit you are analyzing. So uh, from um, one uh, side, we have uh, the problem of uh, determining the uh, context in which uh, this kind of culture could be copied. Uh, I think that uh, a scholarly uh, dimension could be the same or very similar to that uh, of uh, the Bodmer papyri. And I would ask you, uh, what is the uh, uh, scholarly codex uh, you, uh, you have in mind when you compare the codex with uh, the Scoyan one. The second question is, uh, um, uh, Akmimic, uh, what, what do you think about uh, the relationship between uh, Akmimic texts and the Saidic texts? Uh, do you think, uh, we don't have, I think, a demonstration, uh, uh, demonstration about this, but uh, do you think that uh, uh, these texts are uh, always translations from uh, uh, Saidic or uh, can we have some uh, hint as to demonstrate uh, if there is a direct translation from Greek to um, academic. Uh, I have only one uh, text that I think probably is derived directly from Greek, that is the Festal Letters by Seal of Alexandria. Uh, but um, I would like to know what is the, your opinion. Uh, are academic texts always translation from Sahidic and or there is also uh, some uh, uh, possibility to have uh, um, the idea of uh, the hypothesis of uh, academic translation from uh, directly from Greek. And uh, the third is, uh, uh, yes, if, uh, if academic was a uh, uh, thousand than uh, academic, uh, what kind of context we can, uh, um, we can reconstruct uh, for this uh, intellectual uh, milieu? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, three questions. Um, I am not completely sure to have understood the, the first one, but uh, so, um, uh, yes, um, I was, I, I, for me, uh, the, the, there are similarities between the Bodmer papyri and the Arkham papyri in terms of contents, in terms of uh, of uh, cultural milieu, you, you know that because I would already discuss that together, and uh, and of course in terms of formats because some of, of some square formats are very similar to to uh, to, to manuscript uh, coming from the from the Bodmer collection in the I mean in the extensive uh, uh, um, conception of it. Um, uh, and I, I cannot uh, prevent myself to to find similarity many similarities uh, between uh, between both groups. Um, although uh, the the texts are not the same, uh, but uh, this is rather the I would say the originality of the text and the the fact that some old uh, apocrypha, uh, which are part of this uh, of, of this uh, uh, ensemble, um, disappear after after the, after that, and uh, and probably uh, because uh, they were no more in, no longer in use, uh, whatever uh, reason for for this, uh, there are. Uh, what kind of cultural milieu you know better than me? Uh, I, I am. I I I don't. I, don't um, I, I am not the impression that 
that it is a monastic milieu. But again, uh, man, one must be careful and uh, and uh, I probably not. Um, uh, I am not a specialist of uh, of, of, of these things, and uh, so I, I think these things are to be discussed uh, further. As for the dialectal uh, matter, um, again, I am sorry to say so. I'm not I'm not a specialist of art mimic. Um, I um, uh, really read. Uh, uh, before uh, giving this talk, an article by Wolf Peter Funk in uh, the uh, Festschrift uh, Kasser, I think, and uh, he's dealing a, a little bit uh, uh, with this uh, matter. And he said that uh, for the Old Testament, it seems that uh, Armimic uh, ver version are translations uh, for, for, from the Saidic, but he's not convinced, and, uh, and, and I think that he shows that, that it's not the case for the New Testament already. Uh, yeah. In his opinion, I think uh, uh, Armimic translations are, are, are independent. Um, I, I don't know, for instance, about the apocalypse of Elias, uh, where we have to I, I don't know which version, uh, I don't know whether the Armimic is a translation of the Saidic or, or not, but I don't think that it is a simple, uh, that it is a simple and uniform uh, matter. I think that we can have different cases uh, according to the text. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, what, what I would add is that um, uh, the use of Armenic dialect could uh, be related to uh, a, a social group. Uh, that's why uh, in, in the same way we have this uh, uh, dialect L, uh, L4, uh, as uh, Wolf Peter Funk calls it, used uh, for the Manichaean in, uh, as far as, 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 far as in, in Kelis. We could have also uh, the Armenic used by uh, by a social group it's uh, perhaps an, an hypothesis to uh, to follow yeah thank you and yeah. we switch back to Berlin again so are there questions here? Please. Um, and, uh, it's me, Sebastian. And you mentioned uh, the the, the dec decoration of the on, uh, on the last page, the Anch crosses. And of course, uh, Codex Pleasure comes immediately to my to to mind. But I, you also mentioned two Armimic uh, uh, testimonies to to this practice. And I also wanted, I wanted first to ask you uh, where these uh, crosses are also be found. And I also wanted to ask you if you have a, uh, an, uh, um, a more uh, decisive uh, opinion about uh, the particular reason uh, uh, for this habit. Oh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, so there uh, at least another course of this kind, uh, smaller, in the codex of, of uh, the Armimic Exodus. Uh, so this is uh, at least uh, in two in two uh, places in this manuscript. Uh, this has never been uh, really studied and commented on, uh, uh, but I have no idea, in fact, uh, about this. Uh, I know I don't know whether it, or not it's uh, really an influence of old Egyptian, uh, whether it can be uh, rather a question uh, cross with a um, globe uh, above, as uh, some uh, some people say. Those are, uh, I don't claim that it is related to Armimic manuscript. I, I notice only that uh, I found them here. I found them in the Exodus uh, Codex. And perhaps in looking uh, closely uh, at uh, the other 
other manuscript, art mimic manuscript, we could find the other example. May I follow up with uh, some thoughts? Um, uh, I think the, uh, the general dependence between the Ansh and the, and the Coptic cross is uh, firmly uh, established. Uh, and even a, t a topic in, uh, in, in, ancient, uh, in ancient literature, uh, in the church history of Sopho Sophocles, this kind of uh, transfer is, is kind of uh, uh, told in a, in a narrative, as you, as you remember. Uh, but, uh, and, and of course, we find these, the earliest specimens of Christian uh, usage of this sign on, on funerary stela. Mm -hmm. on, uh, fr fr qu apparently quite old funerary stele from the 4th century, if this is reliable. And I, I was, I mean, it came to my mind when, when, you, uh, when you talked about the, uh, the uh, reported finding place of the, of the proverb books on a necropolis, which is, of course, uh, un unsure. And I seem to remember that also the Gresham Codex is reported to have been found in a in a tomb. I don't. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So I was wondering if. Yeah, I, I don't know what I was wondering, but uh, it it's, <laughs> it's, was striking me uh, as some some remarkable. Yeah, you are right. Yeah, it did. It, it, it is was uh, uh, doing some more research in in this direction. I think. It is now the turn of the World Wide Web again, then. So just please speak up. Uh, hello. Uh, this hello. is, uh, yeah, this is Brent Nongbury. Uh, thank you so much for this, uh, this uh, very fascinating talk about a, a codex that I love very much. Um, I have a, a, a comment and a question. The first comment is uh, that the Ankh cross uh, is also found at the end of, uh, of P. Bodmer 20 in the, the Bodmer composite or, or miscellaneous codex. So that, that gives it a, a grounding probably in the, the fourth century uh, if the, the usual dating of that codex is correct. Uh, and the question is um, about the format of this codex. You, uh, pointed to a, an illuminating parallel with the crosby Skoyan Codex for the, the width being greater than the height. Um, this seems to me to be very, very strange and rare among Greek and Coptic codices. Uh, do you know of any other examples where the width is greater than the height? Because I don't. <laughs> no, I don't either. I looked in turn now uh, this afternoon uh, early typ typology of the codex to, to check and uh, and I, I saw that he, he gives only these two mm -hmm. uh, scripts. Uh, perhaps there are others uh, since uh, then, but I don't I don't think so. Not it's it's really uh, it's really rare. I um, I, I wonder whether it has something to do with uh, with the the fact that uh, the, the, the codex is not very uh, luxurious, not very perhaps not very carefully made, uh, and and when the uh, the stationer cut the the, the sheets, uh, it was not very uh, precise, and uh, he had to 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 cut uh, sheets uh, narrower and narrower, and perhaps he did not calculate. Uh, um, the, the right size at, at, at the beginning, it must be very difficult to calculate uh, uh, um, such a cutting with, uh, with uh, sheets uh, uh, narrower as you, as you go to, to, to the center. Perhaps it, has, it, it is something which has to do with, with, uh, with uh, not, not voluntary, but uh, accidental, perhaps. I don't know. Thank you. So, uh, a question from here again, and uh, just a quick note. I forgot to say that if Anne agrees, I think you can ask also in German and French. I guess Anne, you are fine with this. No, on French, it, oh. it will be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Berlin.
Thank you very much for your talk. I'm interested in the binding. Um, you said they, they were um, pa pasted several sheets on top of each other. So were those sheets previously used or were those reused sheets or were they all new? So it's an economical question. I also wondered uh, the second one question, um, how it was composed, how, how the writer knew how many sheets they had need to be stacked because you start writing on one side and go down the other and uh, whether it was well composed, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as for the binding, it's uh, I, 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 it's quite difficult to figure out exactly how it was. But uh, when we look at this old old picture where the uh, papyrus uh, fragments are still in place, uh, what I imagine that uh, is that there were both. Uh, extra sheets under 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 the choir uh, to ensure the cohesion of the of the books between the, the leaves and, and the binding, and there were also uh, papyrus fragments, uh, um, recyc recyc recycled papyrus fragments in order to constitute the the the, the passport. So the, I think that there were both. There were fragments uh, uh, stuck together. Uh, and there were uh, extra leaves um, stuck to the to, to the pathboard and uh, and uh, ensuring the cohesion. Um, but it's difficult to to judge, uh, generally speaking, and and uh, and especially uh, when uh, one has only uh, pictures. Um, I I would like to have some uh, practical. Uh, practice of this, uh, trying to make a cover myself probably would uh, would help to understand how, how it worked. Um, as for your uh, other question, uh, it's again a very difficult question, and I uh, and I ask and uh, I wonder how how, how the, the stationer could uh, calculate uh, how many uh, uh, how many pages he. He needed. Uh, I try to imagine that perhaps um, he had a, a model, and he knew more or less uh, um, the number of uh, chapter verses and st and stickoi, and, uh, and then he made a calculation. Um, but it's um, uh, it's difficult. I I, I cannot uh, really f figure out. Uh, how how it uh, how it it worked I, uh, again well, perhaps uh, the best thing would be to to try to copy a codex and to to see how it what happens in the meantime i learned thanks to a very attentive and professional technical team that there are questions and comments in the chat so we will now look at the chat and then you can comment on it if you would like <laughs> uh, um, you can i have a question if it is possible just, uh, yes but if you could just wait for a minute because we wanted to look at the chat for now <laughs> just one minute uh, yes I mean, we don't see it in the chat here, but uh, no. Uh, okay, and, and can you see the chat or would you like to react? No, to it? no, I don't see it. I, I, I am looking for, but I, I don't find it. Um, okay, so we will come back to it later. So there's ah, a question yes, now. Perhaps perhaps here, uh, but uh, no, I, I, I can't see it. I don't know where it is. Okay, so we, we go on with the next question. So please, sorry for. Uh, good evening. I am Francesco Valerio uh, from Rome, Naples and Rome. Uh, not a question in fact, but um, a, a little remark about the Ankh cross. I would just, uh, um, point out two more instances of this uh, decorative element in two Coptic manuscripts. 
The first one is the um, um, bilingual papyrus codex now in Hamburg. And the, um, the other instance is the parchment codex uh, now in uh, the Egyptian Museum of Turin. Uh, this hunk cross is uh, very fragmentary, but still recognizable. Um, in the Turin codex, it is uh, in the first leaf as a, a sort of frontispiece. In the uh, Hamburg uh, bilingual papyrus codex, it is used as a decorative uh, element uh, for the final title, just like in the Berlin codex just uh, to point out these two instances for the dossier of the occurrences of this element in Coptic manuscript. Thank you. Thank you. And you have an idea about the signification and or the function of this uh, sign? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perhaps only only a, an ancient uh, symbol derived from uh, the old Egyptian culture, which was reused. Mm. Uh, but I don't know why, I cannot imagine if there was a specific reason or simply the, this symbol um, was, uh, <laughs> appeared beautiful and so it was yeah. reused. Perhaps only an aesthetic reason, uh, I, mm. don't, I don't know. So in the meantime, um, I've collected what is in the chat for you, Anne. <laughs> and apart from many people very happy with your lecture, which is, of course, uh, to be expected, uh, there was a discussion between uh, Somiagav and Frank Feder. If they would like and if they can, they can just summarize for you, if I can ask them. So perhaps, uh, Professor Feder, would you like to speak up? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, I only commented on uh, that uh, it's very difficult to uh, geographically determine the Coptic dialects. And uh, also, uh, so wrote about social groups, if behind the academic text, uh, probably social groups, it's equally difficult to determine. We have no whatsoever hint uh, that uh, there is a social group and what uh, this group was. Uh, according to, to our investigations, at least the Old Testament texts in Akmimik are all translations from, or transliterations from Sahidic, if you want. So let's say translate. So the minor prophets, the proverbs, and uh, it's of course- Exodus. That, huh? Exodus. Exodus, yeah. Uh, these um, apocryphal texts uh, haven't, been investigated uh, carefully in this respect, I, I don't know. But uh, there was what was Peter found out for the New Testament, uh, that this is not so clear, mm -hmm. but this has been to re-investigated, uh, that this must be re-investigated again. Uh? So when we come up with new information, uh, also uh, Nathalie Bosson studies on the uh, uh, the minor prophets, especially compared to the, the old Bohiric uh, Vatican papyrus uh, for the classical uh, Sahidic version, there were two different, and, and the older in the Scurian, there were two different Sahidic versions, but the Akmingmik follows again uh, the classical Sahidic. Uh, this is, uh, so uh, if you want to know more about this, especially Nathalie's uh, articles are very, uh, uh, intriguing in this respect. Yeah. Okay, uh, what I want to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for, for your lecture. It's a pity that you can't be in Berlin, but we will. Yeah, it's a pity, yes. We will repeat <laughs> this one day. I, I'm sure Sebastian will organize this. <laughs> hmm. So, Anne, would you like to comment on this or? No, I agree. Oh, okay. uh, I am glad that uh, that Frank uh, uh, intervened and and, uh, and and gave this precision. It's it's very important, and he's uh, the one to do so. So good. <laughs> Thank you. So as time is passing, maybe we go to last two or last two questions today. So one more from here, if there is interest. The last chance. 
Okay, so then one last chance to the World Wide Web, perhaps. So is there anyone who would like to add a further question or comment? So please, please feel free. Yes. <clears throat> May I make, make a comment, just a, a short comment on the topic of the, of the Ankh uh, crosses. You do find uh, two of those also in Agamadi Codex 1, at the end of the prayer of the Apostle Paul. So good, thank you. So what, uh, and any idea about the reason of this, uh, of this cross in the, in the Codex? No, it's, it's certainly decorative, but also, I mean, uh, it's found there together with regular crosses, so... Uh, Christian symbol, basically. So maybe if there is a very last important question or comment, then speak up, because this was a very short question. So if this is not the case, we uh, thank you very much again, Anne, for this wonderful lecture. And we, we thank you here with uh, clapping, and you can do the same on Zoom digitally, if you would like. Yeah?